you found Joshua 9, let me invite you to stand as we read together God's Word. Uh, now today we're going to cover the whole chapter. I mean, I won't read it right now, the whole chapter. But in the sermon, we're going to cover the whole chapter because I'm convinced that this passage can give us some principles of how we will fight the evil that we live in. So I want to start in verse 1, read to verse 6 with the understanding we'll use uh, the entire chapter. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 1. <clears throat> chapter 9, Joshua and Israel have won a battle in Ai. This is where it picks up. As soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland all along the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the six tribes, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, when they heard this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the, inhabitant, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done to Jericho, what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they on their part acted with cunning. They went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins, worn out and torn and mended, with worn out and patched sandals on their feet, worn out clothes, and all of their provisions were dry and crumbly. And they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, and they said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. Let's pause right there. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would find us faithful to your word. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit. I pray that you would heal our wounds, forgive our sins, cause us to rejoice in your goodness. Help us as we seek to stand against evil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We live our lives neck deep, all of us. We live our lives neck deep in fallenness. You can see it at every turn. Whether it's a tangible enemy like the Taliban that you can name and know, that you can see, An enemy that's, that's tangible, it's evil, that you can fight. Sometimes that's how evil is. Or, because of the fallenness we live in, sometimes it's an enemy and an evil like COVID-19 and its variant. It's, it's subversive. It seeps into the air that we breathe and quietly before you even know it, you have it. Before you know you have it. And on the inside, it starts to attack before you even feel it. Sometimes evil is clear. It's straightforward. You, you can see the wrong. You can identify it. And you can pick it out and know how to, to defend yourself. Sometimes it's just that plain. I mean, we can look at the Bible. You have the Bible that shows you, here are the things that are wrong. You can go to the Ten Commandments and... You can read that God's Word talks about murder and lying and adultery, and you can, you can find out what does the Bible say about things like homosexuality or abortion or blasphemy or hatefulness. These are all things that we can clearly say, okay, that, that's wrong. There are other evils. There are other evil, evils that seep in and sneak by and trick even God's people. Things like a, a, a social gospel. Things like um, easy believism or sentimentality or nationalism or CRT or false teachers or, or what we've fought for the last 15 years or so is this cultural Christianity that you feel like you're a Christian because you went to church, but there's actually nothing changed. For those things, whether they are frontal assaults or seeping in, for those things, J.C. Ryle, the great Anglican bishop, J.C. Ryle says 
that which is recorded in Joshua chapter 9 should be a real practical value for all of those that are fighting the good fight of faith. He goes on to say that if you back up and look at the whole Bible, when you read the whole Bible, you find out that, that the devil, that Satan, Satan is depicted both as a roaring lion and a subtle serpent. As the roaring lion, he is straightforward. He, he uses attack and terror and pain. As the serpent, he uses cunning and poison to destroy. And I think there is a lesson from Joshua chapter 9 and what is known as the Gibeonite deception. And what I want to do, and just for a few moments so we get it, so you you have the story, you can go home with the story, you can look at it and read it for yourself. I'd like to walk through the chapter slowly, get a handle on the story, and then let's come back to it and uh, make some applications. So join me there in chapter 9, verse 1. Joshua and Israel have just won a great victory over Jericho as one city, over Ai as the second city. Their momentum is growing. Chapter 9, verse 1. And as soon as all of the kings who are beyond the Jordan, look where they're all from. You got them up at the hills. You got them down on the coast. You got them all along the plains. And there's six, six cities, six groups of people mentioned in verses 1 and 2. No longer is Joshua going to be able to pick off cities like Jericho and Ai and go one by one and get it done. Now the people in that region have come together. All of them. You see the list there. Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. They all came together as one enemy and they're coming down to get Israel. He could see it. Sometimes it's good to be able to know who your enemy is. You know how to defend yourself. It's, it's good to know what is right and what is wrong. And if you see something that is wrong, you know how to actually set up a defense Against that wrongness, they're coming down at him. But it's not always like that, is it? A part of the Hivites, we know that the Gibeonites are actually Hivites because of verse 7. The Gibeonites, somehow or other, they knew, I don't, we don't know how they knew about it, they knew that the people of Israel, they were allowed to make a covenant with, with tribes that lived a long way away. For those that were close by, they had to go in and wipe them out. But for those that lived a long way away, you can find that in Deuteronomy and Exodus, they actually were able to make a covenant with those people. They knew that, and so they decided instead of full frontal attack, let's go and trick them. You see it unfold in verses 3 and 4. The Gibeonites, they come to them and they act like they've been from a long way away. Do you see the cunning? They, they come up, their clothes are ripped, their shoes are worn out. Their, uh, their, their jeans, you, you, you thought you were fashionable with those holes in your jeans, the Gibeonites did it first. <laughs> their clothes, they got holes in their jeans, their sandals are worn out, their wineskins are broken and mended. And to, to the observer, it looks like they came from a long, even their food, you see, it? even their food is, is bad. Now, it feels like they probably are, are are from a long way away. And Joshua starts thinking, though, I'm not sure. They show up in verse 6 and 7. They want to make a covenant. Joshua uh, 7 and 8, he, he's like, I'm, where are you guys from now? Who are y'all? You see, Joshua has this conversation, and they feel the change. And so what they say to Joshua is, we want to be your servant. Verse 9, we, in fact, we want to come and worship your God. Make a covenant with us. The turning point, and really the the terrible point of all of this is down there in verse 14. What happened is Joshua and the leaders, especially Joshua, verse 14 tells us that um, they didn't consult the mouth. If you have the King James, it probably says that. They didn't ask counsel. They didn't ask of the mouth of God. They didn't hear from God. They didn't seek and see, what does God want us to do? They made a decision based on the evidence in front of them without actually asking God what they're supposed to do. 
And it gets him in trouble. Just a few days later, go down the page and you find it, verse 15 and 16 and 17. A few days later, somehow Joshua and the leaders find out that these Gibeonites are a bunch of liars. The problem is that Joshua and Israel believe in God and the covenant they made, they've got to stick to because the name of God is included in this covenant. The Gibeonites, they just tricked them. And all the armchair quarterbacks right there in verse 19 and 20 are saying, grumbling, Joshua should have known better than that. This division is showing up in the camp and Joshua holds steady and he says, we can't kill them, although they deserve to die. We can't kill them because we have made a covenant, and that covenant is based on the name of God. Joshua talks the people down and says, we'll keep the covenant. You can read it all the way down the page, and, and as you see the interactions between Joshua and the Gibeonites, the Gibeonites are, Joshua says, you're cursed, you're, you're going to just be servants, like you said, you're going to chop wood and carry water. And you get down to the end of the story and you find out in verse 27 that Joshua, he made them cutters of wood and carriers of water. And, and the writer here who wrote this is, is looking back at it and he says, look, that happened way back there. But those people are still here. Those Gibeonites, they're, they're still with us. So you back away from the story of chapter 9 and you read the whole thing and you wonder, okay, what is it that what is it that I learned from this? Paul tells us that, that these things are written down for our edification, for our learning. What is it? How do we fight the evil that we see that is tangible? How do we fight the evil that seeps in among us? Here's what I hope you'll learn and what I'm trying to learn. We fight evil. This is how we do it. We fight evil with a strong faith and a gospel determination. We fight evil, strong faith, and a gospel determination. So here are the things that I see. I want to give you two sometimes and two always. Two sometimes, two always. Here's the first sometimes. Number one. <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes evil is straightforward, isn't it? I mean, just like it is in verses 1 and 2. Sometimes you know exactly where it's coming from. You know what they're going to do. Here comes the coalition of kings from every part of the territory. They've come together. There's six tribes. Israel knew what she was up against here. They fought the people at Jericho. They fought the people at Ai. They know what to expect from these kings coming after them. They knew their battle tactics. They knew how to defend themselves. They knew where these people were coming from. They knew what the kings were capable of. Here is blunt, obvious opposition. This is why we feel such frustration in part what's going on in Afghanistan. We, we know, we knew who they were. This is why it's so frustrating. This is, um, this is where we live. For many Christians, this is our story. We, we live in this world. And there's so many enemies, God's people, in this world against us and against our God. You, you can feel it at work. You can, you can feel it. You, a lot of you work for companies that more and more increasingly are coming down on things that you just regular Christianity. You, you might can feel it in in society, as society continues to devolve, what happens is if you happen to be a biblical Christian, ask any college student what, what, she, what she faces, what he faces. You more and more feel yourself being marginalized. You can feel it in our own government. A government that at least at some point in history at least gave some kind of lip service to a creator God is, is now moving further and further away. You can feel it in, you can feel it in our schools. It becomes, increasingly, it becomes increasingly difficult for Christian parents to actually send their children off to public schools. It's harder to do because you see what, what, where, where it's going. You can see it in, 
our views on sexuality. You can experience on social media. You can see it in standards of what is actually accepted and appropriate. Uh, you, you've seen it on the news, I'm sure. Be careful the days that you go to the public library because there may be a man dressed up as a woman reading stories to children. And these are things that are in front of us. So, so how do we live in that world and actually fight what is known the good fight of faith? When you read the book of Ephesians, that's what Paul does for us at the very end in, in Ephesians chapter 6. And you could turn there if you wanted to, just take the whole chunk of the Bible and turn it over to Ephesians 6 in the New Testament. And, and there in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul lays out for us what it is to fight a spiritual fight. What are the weapons that we need there? You find it in verse 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. He says, around your waist you need the belt of truth. We need to be reminded that centrality, that, that the central part of who we are is this objective truth of right and wrong. And, and there it is very close to us holding the entire outfit together is this understanding of truth. He says you need to be covered with the breastplate of righteousness that will protect that which is vital inside of you. That righteousness is not of your own. Paul is the one that taught us about the imputed righteousness of Christ. That when Jesus went to the cross, he took our sin and gave us his righteousness. And that breastplate of righteousness covers front and back us. And it's not just... It's not just us claiming the righteousness of Christ. It is you pursuing a life that is before God, one that is, that is righteous, the breastplate of righteousness. Your feet, chapter 6 of Ephesians tells us that your feet are shod with the gospel of peace. A clear understanding of what it means to become a Christian. That we are Christians because of God's love given to us in Jesus at the cross that the resurrection brought us victory and God's grace through our faith in what he did gives us peace with God. And it's that peace with God that makes us able to actually stand there. Paul says, stand there, the gospel of peace, and pick up with one hand the shield of faith because there are flaming arrows shot at us from Satan. And, and, and he says, you're going to need this this." This trust, believing that God is good. Some of you have lived through this. You've had so many of, of Satan's fiery darts shot at you and you've had to put up this shield to stop them because your faith has been shaken. You've questioned the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God and the why would God do that. And Paul says you stand there fighting with that shield that reminds you. It'll extinguish them. They'll hit that shield and burn for a little bit. You hold the shield and they'll, they'll go out. He says, you stand there with the shield of faith and on your head, there where your mind and your thoughts and all of your emotions, on, on your head is this covering of salvation, this understanding of God's love for us in Jesus. The gospel gives us this salvation and put in one hand the shield of faith and the other, in the other hand, he says, you need the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God so that you don't ever stray very far from what does the Bible say. And he said, you get a picture, go look at it sometime. Ephesians 6, 14 to 18. After he gives this whole picture of the armor of God, in verse 18 he says, now you make sure you are praying for the saints, for one another. You're asking God to intervene and do the miraculous. That's how we, that's how we fight this straightforward evil that comes at us. Sometimes, sometimes evil is straightforward. Second thing I want you to see in the story is sometimes evil is subversive. Subversive. You see it right there in verses 3 and 4 and following. In fact, in verse 4, you'll see the word cunning. The writer tells us that the Gibeonites, they heard the victories and what the Gibeonites decided right there in verse 4 they, on their part, they decided to act with cunning, with, with deception. You see, in order for deception to work, it has to actually be believable. For a lie to work, it has to sound pretty close to the truth. I mean, isn't that what Jesus said of false teachers? That they are wolves covered up in sheep's clothing. I mean, Paul talked about this in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says that, look, we, we are not outwitted by Satan. We are not ignorant of his devices, of his schemes, of his cunning. I mean, it's Paul that said in Ephesians 6 that, 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 that Satan has schemes. He, he has tricks. He has traps. He has plans. You say that God has a plan for your life. It's true. Satan has a plan for your life as well. And it's filled with traps and, and dead ends and, and snares. And you run along the dirt road and there's a weak covering for you to fall in. And as Christians, we are to be, to be alert. We are to be sober-minded. We have been given a mind to think clearly and to think things through. Because this kind of subversive is, is cunning in verse 4, but, but so often it comes with a disguise. Evil comes with a disguise. You, you read in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 6, do you see they come, the Gibeonites, they've, they've come with a plausible story. They you know, acted with cunning. They had worn out clothing, sacks on their donkeys, worn out wineskins. Verse 5, they, they were worn out, patched to, to make, make it look even, they were even further worn out. Their sandals were worn out. Their food was crumbly in verse 5. And, I mean, they come, and what you have there, there is a plausible story with tangible evidence and a humble demeanor. And, and it's believable. Their story is believable. I mean, you get to verse 7 and 8. Joshua has this twinge. He's like, uh, the leaders, they had their suspicions. But they just didn't press the issue enough. Why don't God's people press the issue? This, God has given us this discernment. Keep pushing on it. God's people must... In this day and time, God's people must be discerning. Because Paul says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 11 that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Brothers and sisters, this is why we press devotion and doctrine. This is why when we talk about discipleship, and we'll talk more about it in the days ahead... This is why when you talk about discipleship, discipleship has to be community. It's community and information. We, we gather together worship. Worship must be feeling. You, you want to worship with feeling. It must be feeling and truth. So, so that we can, we've got to see what's real and know what is a lie and live accordingly. And here's what Eve is going to do if it starts to be cunning in verse 4 and then disguises in verse 5, 6, and down in verse 7. You know what evil likes to do? Evil likes to rush you. They're, the Gibeonites, they don't want them to find out. They feel the heat. Joshua's um, looking at them and asking questions. Verse 6, they say, look, make a covenant with us. Do it quickly. And then in verse 7, make a covenant with us. Verse 11, make a covenant with us. Over and over again, they press for the agreement because they know if they get them caught, they won't go back on it. If Israel makes the agreement, they will be bound by the name of God. They'll stick to it. I don't know how, we don't know how the Gibeonites knew that. These Gibeonites are Hivites, by the way. You see that in verse 7. We don't know how they knew this. We don't know how they knew how Israel took their God so seriously. Be, be careful. Be careful when you are being pressured to act or to do something that you are suspect of. Look, God gave you a mind. He gave you a conscience. He gave you informed discernment. He gave you the Word of God as a guide. You, you need to start asking questions. You are right to ask questions. Does, does this decision honor God? Does this square with the Bible? Does this decision adorn the gospel? Does it make the gospel look good? Does this decision uh, help me along my, my own sanctification? Does, does, this, does this reflect good on the Ten Commandments, on the Sermon on the Mount? Can I pray the Lord's Prayer through this decision? And if, and if 
look, if pressure doesn't work, so they're, they're putting pressure on Israel, the Gibeonites are, that, that doesn't seem to be working, so they change tactics. This is what evil, this is what Satan will do. Change the, er, the enemy, the enemy turns now to flattery because it almost always works. You see what the Gibeonites said in verse 8? Look at verse 8. They said to Israel, hey, look, we'll, we'll, we want to just serve you. We want to be your servants. But, I mean, this is what, all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, there's Eve in the garden with the serpent coming to her, and the serpent says, you, you'll be like God. What does the writer of Proverbs say? Proverbs 29, 5. A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. It's a trap. It's a trap. And the worst form, come down the page, the worst form of this flattery is brought up in verse 9. And they say in verse 9, we just wanted, we heard about your God. We want to know your God. Your God is great. They turn spiritual. Be careful now. Because the enemy claims to worship. The enemy claims to be a worshiper of God. Brothers and, brothers and sisters, be careful. Everything that claims to be Christian is not Christian. Every, everything that claims to be of God is not of God. You start asking questions, does this square with what I understand Christianity to be, does this centralize on the cross? Is, is this true to the understanding of the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross in the place of sinners? Do they believe in the resurrection? Does this point me to holy living? A great Presbyterian writer from 100 years ago named J. Gresham Machen. J. Gresham Machen. He wrote a little book. It's about 100 pages called Christianity and Liberalism. And, he, and he's talking about the, the theological liberalism that he fought 100 years ago. And he says they're, they're not two different forms of Christianity. They're two different religions. Brothers and sisters, be careful because sometimes evil comes right at you. You can see it, identify it, you know it, you can fight it. Sometimes, however... Evil is subversive. Two sometimes. Let me give you two always very quickly. Here's point number three. <clears throat> always. How do we fight? Always fight evil with God's word. Whether it's straight at you or whether it's sneaking in. Let's go to the very, the very um, midpoint of the story in verse 14. And this may be the nadir of the whole thing. In verse 14, you find out here's the big mistake. Here's the problem. The text tells us that the men took some of their provisions. Israel did. Took some of their provisions. But they didn't ask counsel. That, that word counsel, that is actually mouth. They didn't seek the mouth. They didn't ask to hear. They didn't want to know what does God say about this. And here is our greatest defense. You go and look at Ephesians chapter 6. What is it that we have one offensive weapon? It's the sword of the Spirit. That is the Word of God. This is how we move forward. This is what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 when he tells him to do your best to present yourselves to God as one who is approved. Here's our Awana. One who is approved, a worker who need not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And I would plead with you brothers and sisters to become men and women of God's word. That's how we fight. It's, it's with God's word. That's an always. Always fight with God's word. Let me give you a second always. Uh, this is number four. Always, always remain faithful, and I would just add, regardless. Let me show you where I get this now. You drop to verse 19 or so. By, by the time we get to verse 19, Joshua and Israel find out that the Gibeonites were a bunch of liars. They've made an agreement with these people 
based on things that are not true. The covenant that they've sworn to before God is built on false premises. And in almost anybody's book, I mean, we have a, a, a good grasp of, of fairness. In almost anybody's book, Israel would have been justified not holding up their end of the deal because the Gibeonites tricked them. But that's not the God they serve. They serve a God who is holy. They've sworn a commitment to these people based on the holiness of God and not the Gibeonites. How, how do you live? How do you live faithfully when you've been treated so poorly? Or, or you, you might be caught up you might be caught up in the framework of your own sin. You, things that you've, you, you've done, they have long-lasting consequences, and here you are living in the midst of those consequences based on the things that you did. You might be, you might be living in the wake of several bad choices that, are, that have resulted in this sort of mountain of regrets. Why does God have you there? God has you there to display His strength in your weakness. God has brought you here to show His grace covering your sin. God has you there to give His peace in your storm. Look, even, even when a tragic mistake has long-term consequences, God will use that for His glory. But there's something else here, brothers and sisters. When you look at Joshua keeping the covenant, you need to hold it up and put it in the light. And, and as you look at Joshua keeping the covenant, we are looking through a glass dimly towards a true and better Yeshua, Jesus. A greater Joshua named Jesus who keeps His covenant. You know, when you read the Bible, you try to put yourself in the story, you, you want to think, okay, I want to be a leader like Joshua, I want to be a part of a people like Israel. But truthfully, we're not any of those people. If you've got to put yourself in the story, we are the Gibeonites. Lying and deceiving and tricking. And yet, because of grace, and more specifically, because of God's grace given to us at the cross of Jesus... The covenant that is made at salvation is not dependent on us. It's dependent on Jesus who holds His people fast and keeps His covenant true. That's how you were saved. This morning as we, as we bring this down to a close and we think about how we live our lives, before we start to sing, I want to ask you to pray with me in just a moment of invitation. Would you join me now as, as we pray together? And with your heads bowed, I just want you to listen to a couple of questions I want to put before you. Here's the first one. Will, will you today, this very day, will you now commit to fighting the good fight of faith? Will you commit? You just may, may want to write it down. I commit to fight the good fight of faith. Or here's something um, I'd like to put before some of you that have been here a long time. Will you today commit to grow as a disciple? Find out what those disciplines are, and you would just say, I want to know Jesus. I want to know His Word better. Will you commit today? Will you commit to trust God that He's going to sustain you as you live with so many mistakes in your past? Will you trust that the gospel of God and the grace of God covers and sustains and brings joy because of what Jesus did for you at the cross? Father, I pray that, that Your grace would extend to Your people. I pray that You would call those that are without faith in Jesus to believe. Father, I pray that we might fight evil 
with the word of God and a trust in your goodness, living in your grace. We thank you that you've made a covenant with us in Jesus. We thank you for keeping it even as we have sought with our lives to break it. And I pray today you would call people to rejoice in the grace you've given us. In Christ's name we pray.